If you've ever seen XKCD 356, you'll know that a certain type of mind is very easily distracted by interesting problems. And for better or for worse, I seem to have one of those minds. This video is the story of one such instance, where I watched a code bullet video one morning about making an algorithm to play the game Snake. And by 2 a.m. the next morning, I found myself unable to sleep trying to teach myself about efficient ways to determine the Hamiltonicity of arbitrary bipartite rectangular grid graphs. And if none of those words made any sense to you, don't worry, they didn't make sense to me before that day, and I'm really only going to be using a couple of them in the rest of this video. After the first three-day weekend of furious coding, I had a running snake algorithm that I believe was actually faster than code bullets when it worked. About half the time, it would get stuck in loops like this, never dying, but also never actually completing the game. It also had a few really annoying sort of poor efficiency behaviors, like a tendency to draw these huge spirals across half the screen that just did nothing but waste a whole lot of moves. After about a month completely addicted to this problem, I had added a whole bunch of features to my snake playing AI, I had dropped the play times by about 15%, and I dropped the failure rate when it gets stuck in loops like that to basically zero. Let me show you how it works. If you haven't seen it before, Snake is an old arcade and early computer game where you are a highly pixelated snake that eats highly pixelated apples in a highly pixelated grid. This one happens to be a 30 by 30 grid. Now I have taken a little artistic liberty with this rendering out of MATLAB. The apples are little red circles in full HD. It's absolutely amazing how new technology can enhance old games. The hard part is that you aren't allowed to run into the walls or yourself. And every time the snake eats an apple, the snake gets one pixel longer, as if snakes are just stretchy green tubes full of apples that never get digested. I try not to think about it too hard. Bottom line is, the game gets really difficult when the snake is really long, because it's really easy to get yourself into a situation where you've trapped the head of the snake and it can never escape. Doom! Or in this case, because I didn't bother to write a failure condition, it just realizes that it can't see the apple anymore and the program blows up. The game is won if you literally fill the whole board with snake, as in, when the snake eats the last apple, its next bite would be its own tail. My goal was to make an algorithm that filled the board every single game in as few moves as possible. The single absolute easiest way to win snake is to make a path that passes through every point on the board exactly once and follow it. You will eventually eat every apple, and because you're always going in the same path, you will never run into yourself, so it's a guaranteed win. However, as Code Bullet mentioned in his video, it's boring, and as I'm about to quantify, it's also painfully slow. The expected travel of the snake before eating an apple is half of the exposed tiles. So at the beginning of the game, that's half of almost 900, so about 450 steps per apple. By the middle of the game, the snake takes up enough space that the apple actually has to spawn closer to the snake's head. And for the last apple of the game, you know the apple will spawn exactly in front of the snake because it's the only available space, so it will only take one move to eat the apple. That means we can actually analytically determine the average 30 by 30 game will take about 200,000 moves. That's really slow. This path that covers every square on the board exactly once is known to graph theorists who know a lot more math than I do as a Hamiltonian cycle. If you imagine a game of snake is basically a square grid of nodes, the Hamiltonian cycle is a way to connect all of those nodes with a line that only passes through each node once and returns to where it started, so it makes a cycle. Not all connections between nodes are available, of course, because the snake itself is on the board, and crossing the snake is illegal. So when you try to draw a Hamiltonian path on a snake board, the entirety of the snake needs to be included in that Hamiltonian path in order, because there's no way that the snake can cross itself or you can like exit the snake and then come back in. That doesn't make any sense. 
CodeBullet's second AI is an implementation of an algorithm created by John Tapsell called the Perturbated Hamiltonian Cycle. It's a really mind-bogglingly efficient algorithm that was designed to be simple so that it could run on a phone. But basically, it runs the snake across this full board Hamiltonian cycle. But occasionally, it decides to jump the line and skip sections of the full board cycle in order to get to the apple faster. The problem is that especially late in the game, this means that certain parts of the board become locked until the snake traverses the whole map. If this section of the Hamiltonian path was skipped and the apple fell here, you now have to wait for almost an entire board's worth of moves until the snake traverses the entire path, returns to this point, and then it cannot skip this section to grab the apple. But what if the Hamiltonian path could change? What if, on the way back, you just took this little skipped part and added it back in, in order to collect the apple faster? That would work just fine. And that is actually the basis of my snake playing algorithm. What I haven't mentioned yet is that while some graphs have many Hamiltonian paths, some graphs have none at all. If you imagine this tiny snake board, the snake can either go straight or turn left. And each case yields a new graph for us to check. If the snake goes straight, there are a bunch of Hamiltonian cycles. But if the snake turns left, there are zero Hamiltonian cycles. The biggest dead giveaway here is the lone node on the bottom right. It only has one connection to the graph, so there's no way to get in and out of that node to complete a cycle. Clearly, if the snake values its life, it wants to go straight so it knows that it can always get to every space. My first instinct when designing a snake AI was to do exactly this for every move. Look at the hypothetical graphs if the snake were to move in any given direction and move towards the apple as long as a Hamiltonian path existed in that direction. The problem with this strategy is that determining the Hamiltonicity of a graph or determining if a Hamiltonian path exists is an NP hard problem. When people say something is exponentially difficult, they normally aren't being literal. But an NP-hard problem is how computer scientists refer to computation that is actually literally exponentially difficult. The bigger the graph, the more CPU cycles you burn trying to find a Hamiltonian path, or even if a Hamiltonian path exists for a given graph. Naively, my gut reaction was that I had a nice computer. I should just crank through it by brute force. Turns out I underestimated what NP-hard really meant. I downloaded a pre-written bit of MATLAB code to find a Hamiltonian path on an arbitrary graph, and I let it churn on a pathetic 10x10 snake board. Now, keep in mind a 10x10 snake board is actually a graph with 100 nodes. After 15 minutes of it not finishing, the very first step in the game, I decided that I would need a more intelligent strategy. That's why I spent so much time reading about it in the first few days. I was trying to find a moderately efficient algorithm to determine Hamiltonicity of, you know, some sort of arbitrary snake board. Turns out that a snake board is a very restricted definition of graph. So, you know, you could make a little bit of progress, but I didn't find anything that was super satisfying. Turns out that just making tiny changes to a pre-existing Hamiltonian cycle is sufficient for the vast majority of cases. When a human plays Snake, they don't reevaluate the entire board with every move. They just look at the stuff around the head of the snake. Imagine that you have this snake and it wants to turn right, but the Hamiltonian path takes it straight. If the snake does turn right, it creates another smaller loop and leaves behind this little disconnected loop of path. Neither of these paths are actually Hamiltonian cycles because they don't cover the entire board. But if you find an easy spot and splice them back together, now you have a new Hamiltonian path and the snake still gets to turn right towards the apple. That's the basis of my dynamic Hamiltonian cycle repair algorithm. So here we go. This is an early version of the program that was trying to repair the paths. Nothing special. It looks pretty darn good. It's going along. It's getting apples. Wait, that's illegal. There are a zillion nested ifs and piles and piles of minus signs in this code. And it is an awful lot to keep track of. Even when it's performing properly, it's important to note that this algorithm is really, really lazy. 
and it doesn't actually try very hard to repair the Hamiltonian path before giving up if it can't find a solution. If it does give up, the snake is forced to follow the old Hamiltonian path, which might actually take it farther away from the apple, but at the very least it ensures that the snake won't die, because it always remembers its escape route. It's always following a Hamiltonian path. I was pretty pleased with the snake algorithm, but it was seeing some weird results. You see how it kind of squiggles everywhere at the start? Like, look at all these wasted moves. It can just go zzz, zzz, or even zzz, 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 zzz. But instead it has to, you know, go blah and make all this mess. When I played 30 games with just the loop splicing repair algorithm, I got an average game length of about 68,000 steps, or about 76 steps per apple. When I made the repair algorithm smarter and able to fix even more situations, more than just the simple loops, it actually got worse, with an average game length all the way up at 72,000 moves, which is over 80 moves to collect the average apple. On the surface, this seems really weird, and I mean, deeper down it seems really weird, that you can make the algorithm better at moving towards the apple, but the game length goes up. Like, it takes longer on average to get to the apple, even though it can normally get there better. That sort of was my first clue that actually the direction from which you approach the apple and the strategy surrounding that turns out to be very important. So some of my later things had to start to correct for that. One of the first things that I did notice about, you know, the wasted zigzagginess of the algorithm was that it was much better at going in straight lines than when it was actually attempting to zigzag. So I went into the A star algorithm that I had downloaded from the MathWorks website, which is basically the algorithm that says which direction is the fastest way to the apple right now. And I fiddled with that algorithm so that it preferred straight lines and did some other things so that it respected the existing Hamiltonian path a little more. This combination of repairing the Hamiltonian cycle with the more advanced version of that algorithm and trying to travel in straight lines turned out to be extremely powerful and dropped my average game length to only 65,000 moves. Now the snake plays pretty darn well, and it looks much more human-like at the beginning of the game because it travels in a lot of straight lines, and it almost never gets stuck in loops, but it still has a few annoying behaviors. I have burned an awful lot of hours watching the snake wander around the board, and you know, you're sort of rooting for it. You're like, oh, that was great. Oh, do you see how it just like wrapped around that corner to the apple? And sometimes you're like, oh no, no, don't do that. Don't get stuck. And then you, then you watch the thing fill in half the board and waste all these moves before it gets to the apple. Most of the small changes that I made to the algorithm were out of frustration at watching the snake do unintelligent things and me having to sit through it again and again. So I started playing whack-a-mole with especially annoying special cases. For example, in this situation right here, the snake sees the apple and goes straight for it, but now it has cut the map in half. If it grabs that apple right now and then turns towards its tail, there's no way to get to all of these nodes. A Hamiltonian cycle would not exist. So instead, it has to waste a whole lot of time filling in half of the board before returning to the apple and consuming it. Any human playing would just say, well, I should go along the edge and not have this issue. So that is the first special case that I addressed. When the snake's path would cut the board in half, the line to the apple turns gray, and instead it hugs the walls. I had to utilize a couple of parity arguments so that it knows which wall to hug, you know, always turning left or always turning right. But uh, getting that figured out brings the median game length down to 59,000. So that was an awful lot of coding effort for an additional 8% improvement. Are you noticing the diminishing returns here? So with this change, in the mid-game, the snake looks brilliant, until it closes itself into a loop. If you were playing a game of snake and got here, you'd realize that a couple zigzags would let you wait until the tail got out of the way, and you could go on your merry apple-eating way. But is that what the snake does? No. It's always trying to follow the red path to the apple unless explicitly prohibited by the non-existence of a Hamiltonian path. So it ends up staying close to the edge and leaving itself only a single escape route, which it's not allowed to use until it's filled in the whole spiral. These big curly Q spiral formations can take up like half the board and it just wastes a ton of moves. So the second critical special case that I addressed 
was that when the snake realizes it's closed in, it tries to run away from the apple and the line turns yellow. This prevents the spirals and sometimes lets the snake get away a whole lot faster. This is a quick rundown of the stats from my many, many trials of snake. The best recorded game was actually played by the most advanced algorithm, which made me feel very accomplished that all of my bells and whistles were actually helping. And that particular game only took 52,698 moves. For the final two versions, I saw no looping failures, so I, I guess it's still possible for it to fail by getting stuck in a loop, but I've never seen it happen, so it can't be very likely. This thing runs at a blistering couple hundred frames per second when it's not plotting, but when it is plotting and actually rendering out video frames, that drops to like 3 FPS, so I'm playing it back a little bit faster than that. Rendering a complete game video takes like 6 hours. MATLAB is probably not the right tool for this job, but it is the hammer that I use to pound in nails and screws and rivets alike. The bottom line is that AIs to play Snake are a riot, and I would love to see more of them. A quick Google search actually doesn't turn up very many. There's a lot of like machine learning tutorials, which are fun, but I don't see them reaching the sort of unkillableness and efficiency that these algorithmic solutions can provide. If you've watched Code Bullets video or this video and get nerd sniped the way I did, please go make a snake AI and then post a video of it and tell me how it works because I would love to see more of these things out in the wild. In the meantime, remember to subscribe for more projects, making, photography, and I guess the occasional simulation or artificial intelligence. Thanks for watching.